helping us today. Um, I'm going to go over just a few ground rules that will kind of help the meeting be as successful as possible. We have 58 of you right now involved in the meeting. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us virtually. Um, I will just state that I really had hoped that we would be able to hold this meeting both virtually and with an in-person option. Uh, but we in state, in, you know, just right now in light of the COVID situation that's going on in our state, uh, we just felt like it was very, uh, probably the smartest thing that we could do is, is hold this meeting 100% virtually. So thank you so much for joining us. I know several of you were disappointed, had wanted to uh, come to Huron to be able to be uh, in the uh, in-person part of that. Apologize for that. We just felt like this is going to keep you all safe. So thanks so much. Um, if I could ask a few ground rules, and that is, is if you can keep your mics muted, unless you're desiring to speak, that would be great. Um, we can also use the hands feature, put your hand up feature uh, that's available. There's, a, based on your screen and where you may have it, there's a hand uh, that looks kind of like that. And anyway, you can find that and push that and that will let folks know that you're asking or wanting to ask a question or make a statement. So use that feature. We can also use the chat and we will have some people monitoring the chat to make sure that if there are um, if there's anyone that uh, has a question they just want to put in that way, they can go ahead and do that. And then we can respond to those questions as well. But we'll definitely make uh, an opportunity for you all to be able to uh, ask questions virtually by just coming on live and making your comment and questions. Hopefully we won't have technical difficulties today. Uh, many of you that have been doing a lot of these virtual meetings know that sometimes we do, and we never really know exactly when they're gonna happen, but uh, everything that we can do to keep you muted, and also if you will be willing to have your cameras off um, when you're not speaking and things like that, that will help too. That helps really control bandwidth, and uh, that just, Kind of makes the meetings go better so we'll try to work on that if we run into any problems we'll let you know it's great to have many of you on i'm looking really quick just through the 59 people that are in the meeting right now a lot of our great partners are out there so we're glad to have you on before we get started what i will do is just uh ask if there are any additions to the state technical committee um, agenda uh, we've sent this out to you all. It was included in the team's invite, but if there are any additions, uh, please let me know. I've got a few additions already that I want to add um, under my kind of opening comments. I'm going to talk a little bit about the 2020 Cooperative Conservation Award. Um, we're going to also, after the congressional representatives, I want to give Jeremy Davis, our FPAC regional coordinator, a chance to make some comments. I've seen Jeremy join us, so thank you for that, Jeremy. We're also going to have Brian Walsh with the South Department of Ag and the Department of Natural Resources make a few comments to us too. Um, and then we're going to be able to share toward the bottom of the agenda a new salinity uh, web meeting that's being planned. So we've got those things added to the agenda. But are there any other items that you all would like to add to the agenda? Very good. Well, you're going to have another chance to add things later, so feel free to do that. If you want to put any things addition that you'd like to talk about in the chat, you can do that as well. So we'll get kicked off with our first item, and that's just kind of a welcome and a few opening comments. I've got several things there that I want to cover with you. But first of all, again, thank you so much for joining us. This is a strange time that we're all working through. Uh, we're getting a lot done, though. And I want to just let you know that several times uh, in this meeting today, you're going to hear me address just great accomplishments that we got done this past year. And we'll talk a little bit about those. A lot of that, though, all goes out to all of you in the partnership. So we've had some amazing years with farm bill programs. We've gotten a lot of other just good conservation on the land. Uh, there's just a lot of excitement going on across our state. So I'm very proud of that and all that we worked on together to make that happen. Thank you so much. This past year, 
Um, in some work that we're doing now to prepare for the end of the year, we know from our records that over 46,000 conservation practices have been applied across our state. Um, that's an amazing number um, with just a lot of good work done. While this year was challenging in a lot of ways, it was a year that really allowed a lot of conservation work to get completed, and a lot of that's because of the weather and things like that. So that's very pleasing to see that happen. We had a lot of conservation that was kind of behind the schedule a little bit, kind of based on weather from 2019, but 2020 allowed us definitely a chance to get a lot of that done. So with that, just a couple other things that I would like to cover. Um, one is uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, kind of a new member of our South Dakota leadership team. Um, it, this person, when they introduce themselves, you'll uh, realize that you've known this person before and you're right, but this person is in kind of a new role with South Dakota NRCS and I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. And that is I'd like to introduce Colette Kessler, who is our new Assistant State Conservationist for Partnerships. And I'll talk just a little bit about that position, but Colette would like you to turn on your camera and say hello to the group. Hello everybody. So it's nice to see you and meet you. And uh, I, I know many of you from my previous uh, career with public affairs and I'm really excited to be moving into the partnerships position. So uh, with that I'll turn it back to Jeff. Thanks Colette. Yes, we're really excited to have Colette in this role. Um, she's gonna really help us in a lot of ways. I think across South Dakota, continue these strong partnerships that we've had in the past and I think even take them to a new level. So we're really excited to have her in that role. So while we're on the topic of partnerships, why don't we just move right into the discussion about the 2020 Cooperative Conservation Board. So for many years, uh, every year, the agency has kind of looked at all of the folks that we're working with, individuals, groups, partners, the like, and we've tried to pick, uh, pick out someone who we really felt um, was amazing over this past year. And we've done that again in 2020. And I want to let you know, I've got the award here by my uh, stand-up desk. You won't be able to read it really well because it's shiny and it has a reflection of the, all of you on the screen kind of in that uh, award. But this year's award is going to the South Dakota Pheasants Forever Private Lands team. So congratulations to that group. Yes, let's uh, clapping and I will as well. They have just done an amazing job this past year. They're working on so many of our different efforts. Um, I really also want to say thank you to other key partners that help us make that happen, uh, primarily South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. Uh, it's definitely a cooperative effort between them that helps put that South Dakota Farm Bill team out on the landscape. This past year, they've done a lot. Later in this agenda, you're going to hear about um, what's going on with uh, Conservation Reserve Program, CRP, from Owen. And you're gonna hear about a lot of work this past year and that team did a lot of that, but they've done a lot of other work on other farm bill programs as well. And our easement program, just in equip and conservation stewardship and the like, just cons good conservation planning out in the landscape. A lot of work on every acre counts and the list just goes on and on. So thank you to that team. There's quite a few of those folks that are on this call today um, that are joining us uh, to kind of hear their shout out. So congratulations to them again. But I also just want you all to know that we are so proud of them and the work they've done. In the past years, we've, you know, we've recognized other groups. Uh, South Dakota Corn Growers was last year, and, and the list goes back for quite a while. We've worked with so many different uh, partners to make things happen, and we're so proud of them and what they get done. So thank you to the South Dakota Pheasants Forever Private Lands team again. You're the Cooperative Conservation Award winners for 2020. Thank you so much. Appreciate the work that you've done. Very good. I think those are some of the key opening comments that I wanted to make with you today just to kind of get us kicked off. I'm sure I'll have some others along the way. Um, but I think at this point, what I would like to do is see if we have any representatives out there from our congressional representatives. I believe we have Jim Slechter from Rounds' office that has joined us. Um, and there's maybe others as well. That's one hard thing about this is it's hard to kind of manage all the people that are in the meeting and who may have joined us. I've seen a couple 202 numbers and things like that. But if there are other folks out there, 
please uh, chime in. So, Jim, if you're out there and would like to make any comments for uh, Senator Rounds, you can come online and do that. And if there's other people out there, too, we want to give you an opportunity if you have anything you'd like to add. Well, right now I'm not hearing it. if there was anybody who's on and uh, is unable to get off mute or anything like that, or if there's other can folks out now? there. Okay. Yes, I can. Can you hear me now? I can, Jim. You're coming through loud and clear. Go ahead, sir. All right. I, I just trying to figure out the technology, I guess. So, uh, what I was saying is, you know, we're we're going into a lame duck session here, and obviously there's some priorities we need to take care of before our new Congress starts. But the biggest thing probably is our budget. Um, we, we're in a continuing resolution, which ends here at, on the 11th. And so we're going to have to address that. So, and then obviously there's some coronavirus aid that both the House and the Senate are working on, but don't agree on. So and we've seen a little bit of movement the last couple of days. So, but those are probably our biggest priorities right now. So. Thanks, Jim, for those comments. Are there any other congressional representatives that would like to just give us any updates or share a few words? All right, hearing none, we'll move to the next agenda item, and this is kind of an add-on, but Jeremy Davis, our FPAC Regional Coordinator, would you like to come online, Jeremy, and say just a few words to the group and share any insights you may have? Sure, glad to, glad, glad to be uh, able to join today. Uh, I'd hope to also be able to come to Huron, but uh, definitely understand, you know, with all the issues going on with COVID, our, our travel all the way around is pretty uh, restricted right now due to COVID. Um, but that just is is what it is at this point. But I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be part of the technical committee virtually and look forward to the discussion today. And, and as always, if anybody needs anything from the FPAC uh, leadership side, just let us know. Jeremy, thanks so much for being present with us and listening to the comments today. And if you have anything that you want to add throughout the meeting, please let us know. Appreciate it that much. Sounds good. Appreciate it. You bet. OK, so in addition, I want to include at this time, and I mentioned it earlier, Brian Walsh. Um, and Brian is currently serving as the public affairs director for the South Dakota Department of Ag and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. So, Brian, if you'd like to come on with us and share a few words, that would be much appreciated. I, you're going to talk with us kind of about this merger. And uh, I think we're uh, lots of folks on this call. Uh, we'll uh, be appreciative of your comments and, and learning more. So thank you. You bet. Thanks, Jeff. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you well. Thanks, Brian. Yep, Excellent. and you're coming through well too. Perfect. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you so much for giving me just a few minutes this morning to, to update you on the, the merger of the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, as you might imagine, with the announcement, it's been a busy couple months here at, at Department of Ag and DENR. Um, on September 8th, our DENR Secretary Hunter Roberts took over as the interim secretary for the Department of Ag. And since then, we've been working on finding synergies and, and building an organizational structure for the new agency. Um, probably the most, most frequent question we get is, is why would you merge these two agencies? Um, and as some of you may know, early on in Governor Nome's term, excuse me, um, she moved the agricultural business development activities out of the Department of Ag over to the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Uh, with that move, both Department of Ag and DENR are largely regulatory in nature. And as the folks on this call certainly know, agriculture, conservation, natural resource protection they really go hand in hand. So it, it to us, it makes a lot of good sense to regulate these industries and organizations under one department. Um, I think the key thing to stress today um, and to everyone is that 
it's important to remember that all of the Department of Ag's and Department of Environment and Natural Resources programs and responsibilities uh, will remain in place moving forward. There will be some changes, but we will continue to do our jobs and implement our programs as we have done in the past. Um, and try to try to highlight some of those changes, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Um, and hopefully you are seeing. Um, Looks good, Brian. It's coming there, to you. There you go. You're seeing a copy of of what is our proposed organizational chart. Um, of course, nothing's final yet, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But uh, I just kind of wanted to walk through this so you could understand uh, how this new agency might look moving forward. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Secretary Roberts is currently the interim secretary of Ag and DENR secretary, and he will continue on as the DANR secretary moving forward. Um, we'll have a finance group uh, directed by Dar Darcy Kaiser. Uh, Taya Runyon will be the agency's general counsel. Jason Simmons will be uh, director of outreach and uh, largely responsible for the 19 boards and commissions that will report to this agency. Um, I get a box there as the public affairs director. And then the agency is broken up into five divisions. That's the plan. Um, first division will be the Office of Water, which will be headed by Dean Goodman, who will be the deputy secretary and the director. And that will include the drinking water program, uh, surface water quality program, and the water rights programs. Uh, next will be the Division of Agriculture and Environmental Services. Um, Kent Woodmansey is on board to be the director of that division, and programs in that division will include air quality. Uh, what's got a new name is Livestock Services, which will be a, a combination of the DENR's CAFO permitting program um, and the Department of Ag's dairy program. We have our waste management program. We have the Inspection Compliance and Remediation Program, which is a, a combination of what was DENR's Groundwater Quality Program, uh, the Spills Program, those things, along with uh, egg services programs like, like the regulation of pesticides and, and hemp. Uh, and finally, that division will have our Minerals and Mining Program. Um, we'll also have a Forest Conservation and Forestry Division. Um, will be headed up by Bill Smith. Um, and that'll include the forestry conservation, uh, DENR's watershed protection program, and then Department of Ag's plant industry and apiary programs. Uh, we'll have a financial and technical assistance program, uh, which will include DENR's environmental funding program, like the uh, Clean Water SRF and the Drinking Water SRF, those programs, uh, the Petroleum Release Compensation Fund, and of course our geological survey down in Vermilion. And finally, that fifth division is the State Fair, uh, which has historically been part of Department of Ag and will continue to be, and uh, is headed up by Peggy Betch. So that's the general general structure of the agency. I'll just leave this up as I as I talk, so you have a chance to look at it. Uh, one thing you may have noticed is that um, there is no wildland to fire well, wildland fire division on this chart. Uh, as part of the merger process, we found opportunities to you know, make improvements statewide. And one of them is that we could move our wildland fire division to the Department of Public Safety. Um, and it, it really seems like a much better fit there. Um, so that'll be the plan moving forward. Um, so what's the timeline and the schedule of this deal? How's it going to play out? Well, the governor announced the merger way back on August 27th. Uh, like I said, on the September 8th, Secretary Roberts took over as the interim Secretary of Ag. Uh, and then since then, and prior to the upcoming legislative session, we've been working on the organizational chart um, and how we can put our agency together to present it to the legislature, um, both organ organizationally and with our with a unified budget for FY 2022. Um, once legislative session starts within that first five day window, the governor will issue an executive order that merges the departments and creates the DANR. 90 days after that order, um, the merger will become complete. And we so we anticipate officially being the DANR on or about April 1st, 2021. And then 
the new unified budget will go into effect July 1st, 2021. So we're really very excited about this merger. Uh, we think it presents a lot of opportunities to get our ag and environmental experts together uh, and collaborate and get better outcomes. Um, and we're looking forward to you know, continuing the relationships we have with your group um, and working on South Dakota issues moving forward. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions if you have any. Thanks so much, Brian. Are there any questions at all for Brian at this time? Otherwise, I'm sure, Brian, you're able to be emailed or they could be sent to Bill Smith that many of us know and Bill could direct them to you as well. So. Yep, Any questions or or my email is just brian.walsh at state.sd.us. Feel free to, to give us a contact anytime. We'll be happy to, to help you out. Very good. Any questions for Brian before we move on? Brian, thank you so much for the update. It was great to have you on today. Appreciate it. You bet. Appreciate the time. All right, next on our agenda, we're gonna have a soil health update. As you know, um, Kent Veleger has been giving us updates off and on uh, for several of our state technical committee meetings now. And so Kent's gonna join us again and walk through some slides with us. So Kent, I'll turn it over to you, sir. All right, great. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, am I coming through okay? You are. Okay, all right, I'm gonna switch screens here real quick. Okay, so it's been a couple meetings since I've uh, been able to talk to you all, um, uh, but I'm glad to be here today. Um, so we're going to continue on with uh, the No-Till Doesn't Work series. And just a refresher for those of you um, that may have attended other meetings and maybe some of you that haven't, or this is your first one. Um, so basically what this series is doing is we are going over uh, the five principles of soil health. and our next slide here. And so the previous uh, couple meetings that I was presenting at, we covered uh, the first two principles that are in orange that you see there. And that's keep the soil covered and minimize soil disturbance. And so those are categorized basically under our protecting the soil. Um, keeping the soil covered prevents uh, wind and water erosion and minimizing disturbance, um, protects our soil surface, and also prevents erosion also. Um, those two and today we're going to move on to uh, the third principle in line here and that's maximizing plant diversity and you can see we've got the next three principles maximize plant diversity continual living root on the soil and livestock integration those are under the the feed the soil portion so these are the soil principles soil health principles that really really kind of excite me and i think they're things that we're seeing a lot of uh, headway being made with our producers and landowners in South Dakota. Um, you know, we've kind of known keeping the soil covered and minimizing soil disturbance. We know those prevent erosion. We know those help to slow or stop soil loss. Um, but now we're really kind of getting into an exciting area of how do we start rebuilding our soils? How do we make them more productive? Um, how do we make them uh, work for producers and landowners even better than, um, than our current state of soils that we have? Okay, so let's continue on with maximizing plant diversity. Um, so this is just a screenshot of, it's actually a picture of, of a community garden here in Huron. And, you know, a, a close up, you might not be able to tell how large of an area this is, um, but it's probably only 100, 100 feet by maybe 25 feet. And, it's just a picture to show you diversity of plants and what we can do um, with our soils here in South Dakota and things that we can grow and the potential we have for production. So what is plant diversity and, and why is it important for soil health? Um, plant diversity can really be quite complex and we could really kind of get into a lot of rabbit trails and into the weeds if we wanted to today. 
But what we're going to do, and this is what most of our planners do, um, a lot of people they break plant diversity down into four categories, sometimes five. Um, but we're going to stick with four here today. And you'll see we've got um, broken down into a warm season grass, warm season broadleafs, cool season grasses, and cool season broadleafs. And so we've got pictures here on uh, the right of your screen of all four of those categories. And you'll look where we've got um, planting into into cereal rye. What that cereal rye is, that's a cool season grass, for example. So if you want to know what cool season and warm season is, basically the way to think about it is when does that plant grow best? Does it grow best under moist and cool conditions or does it really kind of thrive under hot conditions? And cereal rye, winter wheat, uh, spring wheat and oats are certainly things that fall under that cool season cap. If you go below there, we've got cool season broadleafs, and that's uh, an overhead picture of, of, a, of a young cover crop stand. And what you're looking at there is some brassicas, which are um, turnips and radishes. We've also got, um, can't see them quite as well, but we've got peas growing in there. Peas would be classified as a cool season broadleaf also, and also as a legume or nitrogen fixation plant. In the upper right of your screen, we've got uh, a couple of things that we're looking at. The left part of the picture is showing soybeans, and those will be classified as a warm season broadleaf. And then the rest of the screen is kind of being taken up by that nice uh, looking prairie stand there. And that prairie stand is showing basically all four categories of plant diversity. We've got cool season and warm seasons, both in grasses and, and broadleafs there. And then on the bottom part of the screen in, in the right, you'll see a very familiar plant to all of us, and that's corn. Corn is a warm season grass. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about each one of these here separately now. Okay, so warm season grasses. Um, and when we're looking at native plant community or our perennial plant community, um, they're very familiar species to, to a lot of us that work in natural resources or in wildlife even. And some of those are big blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass, buffalo grass. And so those are the plants that do really well when summer's really kind of hot and cooking. When it's hot it, towards the end of June and throughout July, that's when those plants are doing best. And it's the same for the corn, the millet, and the sorghum, which are all those warm season grasses. And the reason they do well when it's warm is because they're classified as C4 plants. And we're not going to get too much into uh, photosynthetic pathways today because that's a whole other discussion and, and probably a semester class at uh, one of our land grant universities. But C4 plants, basically what they are is they process carbon and the water more efficiently um, through photosynthesis, but they only really do it when, it's, when the temperatures are warm. So that's in that 80 degree plus category. And that's why those plants do the best when it's really hot and warm and then we've got adequate moisture also. Okay, the next one we're gonna look at is our cool season grasses. And we've got a screenshot here of some cereal rye that's coming up. And cereal rye is certainly a cool season grass, um, but our native perennials that are cool seasons are wheat grasses, green needle and wild rye, for example. They do really well um, early in the spring. They start growing early when those ground temperatures are still cool um, and they like to have good moisture. And for our annual crop types, the best examples we have are wheat, rye, and oats. They all fall under that cool season category and that's they fall under C3 uh, for so photosynthesis production. And basically what that means is that they are very efficient at converting that CO2 also, but they're only efficient at doing that when the temperatures are cool. When the temperatures warm up, these plants don't seem to do as well. Um, that's because they spend a lot of their energy basically just trying to stay cool. And they're taking a lot of their energy production and it's going through the stomata on their leaves to um, keep that plant cool. Okay, the third category we're gonna look at here is broad season, um, warm season broad leaves. And some of the good examples of this one are sunflowers. Uh, soybeans even fall into that. Um, and although I'll discuss, there's maybe some discussion whether they should be warm season or cool season here in a second. Um, in our native plant community, uh, some of our Coreopsis plants, 
and a lot of our aster type plants. And so we have native asters, but there's a lot of other plants, um, native flowers that are related to asters that are warm season also. So in our crop production, we've got sunflowers, dry beans, dry edible beans, cowpeas, buckwheat, for example, that fall under <clears throat> our warm season category. <clears throat> okay, cool season, our final category here uh, for broadleaves is, if you look at our perennials, we've got clovers. And actually, many of our prairie flowers, our native prairie flowers, are, are cool season broadleaves. And it kind of goes against what most of us would think. We would think this is South Dakota, we get hot in the summer. Um, most of them should be really liking it when it's hot. Um, but actually, they all fall under the C3 category. Um, they do actually grow best when it's cool and they have adequate moisture. Um, they still do okay because they're deep rooted when we have hot temperatures. Um, but most of our native um, forb community is actually C3 category. Under our cropland category, we've got peas, flax, alfalfa, mustard, radish, beets. Now, a lot of those are not plants that are grown as, as much anymore in South Dakota, although certainly there was a time when we had uh, quite a bit of peas and flax. Uh, that were grown here, but we just don't see that much uh, grown today. So a lot of these um, you'll see are grown for forage or cover crop um, selections. And with that, let's talk about uh, why diversity. Why do we need it? Why is it important for improving our soil health and the productivity of our, of our soils? Uh, the long and short of it is that the more diverse plants you have out there, the more diverse diet that they are feeding um, our soil biota, our soil life. And so it's just like you and I, if we were going uh, to eat a healthy diet, you want it to be diverse. You wouldn't just want to eat fast food every day. And so it's the same for our, our soil life. They like to have a diverse diet. And that diverse diet comes through them being able to eat uh, when that plant senesces or dies or is harvested and there's residue on the surface. Uh, there's a different diet for those that soil life to eat on the surface. And and there's also a difference in um, the root exudates that each plant puts out. And so, for example, that corn plant might put out a different sugar or different carbohydrate than the wheat plant might, for example. And so the more diversity we have in there, the more happy we can keep our soil life. Uh, the next reason it's important to have diversity of plants in, in the landscape and for our soil health is that there's obviously, as you can see in this, this is a great graphic and it's one of my favorite ones. It's been around for quite a while and it's basically called plant prairie. And it just shows the different rooting structures and rooting depths of a lot of our native plants. Um, but you can correlate this also to our, to our row crops that we plant. Uh, we know that corn has a deep fibrous root. Uh, soybean is going to be more similar to, um, if you look on your screen, to like the wild indigo, indigo root. It's not quite as fibrous, not quite as deep, but it has different purposes also. So it's important to have those different plants out there to provide different types of structure to our, our soil. The grass temp type plants are usually more fibrous, usually what we consider to be more sod forming. Um, we're also looking at different rooting depths. They've all got their different uh, areas that they like to root down to. Um, if you look, for example, at that uh, compass plant, Kind of got those long stringy roots that go very deep it can go 15 feet deeper deeper um, so you can imagine that yes it's very drought resistant but it's also pulling up nutrients from deep in that soil profile and bringing them higher up to make them available um, to other plants and the soil life okay we've talked about the soil biome and the food that's produced um, by our plants it's important to have that diversity to keep a diversity of soil life out there also so how do we do that? It's easy to say, yep, we need to have a lot of different plants out there and it's good for the soil, but really how do we make that work for a producer um, into their system so that they can still be productive economically and productive agronomically and productive for their livestock also. And so this is where it gets to be a little bit interesting. It can be tricky. It requires a new set of management skills uh, sometimes for producers, um, but there's a lot of this going on in the landscape. And so all these pictures you're going to see here are, are local examples from uh, mostly eastern South Dakota. Um, but the first thing we can do, and this is really quite simple, an old concept of crop rotation. Uh, we know crop rotation benefits all of our crops. 
Um, we've known that for, for centuries, to be honest. Um, for example, we see a picture here of a field of oats. Uh, we know that plants, uh, my grandfather always planted corn following his oats. And he always did that because that corn in the rotation always did better 15 to 20%, oftentimes following oats than even following other crops in the rotation. Um, so there's agronomic benefits for it. Um, that's ways that we can fit in. So this is a plug for also putting some small grains back in our rotation. Um, we can talk economics of small grains, um, but that's probably for another discussion. Um, often we'll get pushback, well, I, I can't make money off of wheat or small grains, um, but we just oftentimes don't attribute that yield bump we get in corn, for example, back to those small grains. Um, and there's other opportunities to uh, have livestock following small grains on cover crops. Okay, um, I don't want to leave out our, our livestock producers out there and their grassland rotations and, and native rangeland. Um, so how do we maximize diversity when we've already got uh, a perennial plant out there growing in the landscape? Um, the way we do that is basically grazing like the bison. That's through, um, through good use of our, of our plant community out there and then a long rest. So if you think back to those bison herds, they were grazing really high numbers uh, on an area and they would graze it really quite hard, but then they were always on the move and they kept on moving. And they wouldn't come back to that area for maybe several months, maybe a year, or maybe even more. So there's lots of rest, but there's heavy use. And what that does is it, uh, the livestock are utilizing a lot of the plants out there. They're not ne um, necessarily fancy or the stuff they really like and leaving uh, the stuff they don't. And then that plant increases in the future. So we want to get good use and we want to leave lots of rest on our uh, perennial communities out there on our native grazing sites. Okay, back on to how do we increase diversity on cropland. Um, cover crops are, act, are something that's kind of been a, oh, a trendy subject, let's say, and maybe for the past 10 or 15 years or so. Um, wasn't used a whole lot necessarily before that, but really we see a lot of producers starting to look at cover crops in their rotations, and they're doing it for several reasons. Um, one of the reasons they're doing it is for livestock forage. Um, the picture you see here is a cover crop mix that was seeded following small grain harvest in late July, early August. This was planted by a producer, and then it's allowed to grow, and then in the fall, usually in November, this producer will go out and, and graze several fields that they have here. So you can imagine this is it's a good economic choice for this producer. It allows him to keep his livestock off uh, out of the lots for a couple months longer. It allows him to take livestock off of his native pastures sooner because he's got another forage base. And it's also something that's uh, in the long term, it's increasing the soil health and productivity of the soils. Okay, this is a video and I hope the video works here for you. This is one way that we can increase some diversity into our cropping systems while we actually have a crop growing. And so this is a, a video taken from a demonstration here um, in the Huron area from a couple of years ago. And what you're seeing here looks just like a, like a drill, any old drill, any old drill. It's a 15 foot interseeder actually, and you're gonna see the video. If you have your speakers on, um, it is running equipment, so it can be a little bit loud. So just be prepared maybe to lower the volume on your speakers. I'm gonna let this run. It's about a 30 second video. Um, so this is one of the first times we demonstrated this in the area and now there's several producers that have built their own interseeders. And what you've got is 30 inch corn rows and it's seeding uh, several rows of cover crops between each 30 inch row. Uh, this is about the, the V between V5 and V6 stage uh, for this corn here. And I'm going to move on a little bit longer. Um, but that's an opportunity to put diversity into, into a monoculture crop. And many of you might be thinking, why would we want to do that? Uh, don't we want to, uh, don't we spend a lot of time and energy spraying out weeds so they don't compete? Why would we want to put something in there that's competing? Um, well, we know that if you plant that, that cover crop after that V5 or V6 stage, um, what happens is that corn canopy shortly thereafter 
and that cover crop uh, germinates and comes up but doesn't really it just kind of sits there almost dormant until that corn starts to to dry down and more light is able to penetrate through the canopy and then you get a diverse crop that's growing into the fall and then if you harvest that corn you've got opportunity if you have livestock to graze them um, if you don't have livestock it's just a soil building opportunity um, so we've done that there's several producers that are doing that throughout throughout the state that have been doing it for years um, we've got some that are actually doing replicated trials to prove there's no yield loss for crop insurance purposes um, and in fact many crop insurance agents are getting on board with this practice um, because they're seeing the, the advantages of it Okay, this next photo is one. Um, this is this is a little more. I don't know, maybe advanced for for what a lot of producers are comfortable with doing. But basically, this is intercropping or polycropping. And there are producers out there that are trying this. This really adds some complexity uh, to harvest and planting. Um, but they're starting to see good opportunity here. And what you're seeing here is a small grain with soybeans. And you're looking at this and saying, well, how in the world do we harvest that? And this is one where uh, this is a producer from one of the eastern states from here, uh, Jason Mock. And what he does, he harvests this, harvests the small grains. And on his planter, he's basically got guards that push down the beans or block the beans from the harvest to the harvesting. And so he's able to take the small grain and then the soybeans come up and then later on he takes the soybeans. Um, so as you can imagine, the, the total yield for the small grains and the soybean is, if you look at the, let me back up, if you look at the yield for the small grains on its own, it's not as high as if you were to plant a straight small grain field. It's the same for the soybeans, it wouldn't be as high as if it was solid soybeans. But the overall harvest uh, benefit and ha harvest haul is, is greater as a whole. And so basically they're looking at the relationship of a legume plant and a small grain plant and how can we maximize the the relationship there and the benefits and how can we harvest them separately so this is kind of a little far advanced but we do have producers that are looking at this okay the the last quarter category we we'll talk about and on maximizing plant diversity is is restoring sites that are currently crop ground back to a uh, native plant community uh, there are opportunities for this, um, especially on some of those fields that maybe aren't as productive cropland um, economically as, as they should be. And maybe the best use for that land it should be back to a uh, perennial plant community. And this is where I encourage uh, producers or landowners, if you're looking at doing this, uh, you know, it's kind of easy to say, well, we'll plant two or three grasses and call that good. Um, and we'll graze it and it'll be better and more economical than our crop. Um, but this is where I think we can really make good hideaway in restoring those native plant communities. It may be a little bit more expensive to plant that big, expensive 15, 20 species mix, um, but I, I truly believe in the long run that it's more productive and uh, will go better through throughout the years as we have our wet and dry cycles. Okay, so that's my short presentation today for you on um, increasing plant diversity in our landscape and it's important to increasing soil health. Uh, with that, Jeff, I will open it up to any comments or questions. Kent, thank you so much. Any questions for Kent before we move on? Ken, before you don't uh, or lose your screen there, I want to point out to everybody your email address there. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to it. Sorry. That's OK. Yep. So I'm very appreciative of Kent and all the work that he's been doing on soil health across our state. Um, he works with a great team of folks across our state and uh, serves under Nathan Jones, our state school scientist. But if any of you want to reach out or get a hold of Kent, you see his email address there. And, um, you know, I just, I also want to just give a shout out to all of the partners, many of them that are on this call today that are working with us to improve soil health across South Dakota. I'm so proud of the work you're all doing, and it's amazing uh, uh, for what we're getting accomplished. And I think that, but there's still a lot of room for us to grow. So we're going to keep working on this one in a very big way. 
Thank you so much. Any questions before we move on? Thanks, Ken. Great presentation. Appreciate it. All right, next we're gonna move on to talk about our South Dakota planning prioritization tool. Jessica Mihelski, our state resource conservationist is gonna join us today. Um, like so many things, the amount of opportunities, the amount of requests that we receive as a state uh, for planning, but also programs is incredible. And so one of the ways that we're trying to make sure that our field staff are working on the most important resource concerns and issues for South Dakota is to do some prioritization along the way. So Jessica is gonna talk with you about the state uh, planning prioritization tool, share that a little bit with you and get from you any comments or thoughts that you might have. So Jess, I'm gonna turn it to you. Okay, thank you, Jeff. I'm going to share my screen here. This is a handout you also received um, in your packet with the agenda but I just wanna share, um, share the planning prioritization tool that was developed um, for fiscal year 2021. Um, like Jeff said, we, uh, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of requests for planning assistance. A lot of those requests then eventually turn into um, program applications. Um, and just to give you a little background of kind of where we've been sitting um, over the years, you know, as you as you know, in my many of you know, in my previous um, position, I was the CSP program manager for about eight and a half years. And the CSP uh, contracts that we funded every year, you know, a lot of times ran in the 300 to 500 range um, for applications and contracts, and and we were really able to fund a lot of contracts. Um, with with the dollars that we received from national headquarters well throughout the past couple of years uh, that has really changed and the the overall look of of national headquarters has been that that csp money really needs to be um, more evenly distributed throughout the united states and so they've really pulled a lot of those funds back from us and so just to give you a little a little information on that um, I talked to Joyce Trevithek, who is the, the new CSP program manager, and she said for 2020, we actually received over 1,000 applications and only funded uh, between 90 and 100 of those. So you can see that, that, that there's really a need um, in the C, you know, for CSP program. And then EQIP, on the other hand, we were actually able to fund about a third of the applications that we received. Um, for EQIP for 2020, but still, that's that's a lot of applications that we receive from producers that um, are not going to be be able to be funded. And so we really need a way to prioritize um, the planning up front, uh, which producers that we are going to prioritize for working with, and um, which ones are going to be a lower priority. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to work with them. It just means that it might be another year or so before we get to those um, to those producers that have requested our technical assistance. So I worked with a committee. I had a, a NRCS staff from across the state, a couple from each area to assist me in developing this uh, prioritization tool. And then also I am serving on a national um, team to develop a prioritization tool on the national level also that will be rolled into our planning uh, program, which is called Conservation Desktop or CD for short. So it, it really is being looked at on a national level. There's many, many states that have an overwhelming um, request for technical and financial assistance, and we just don't have the funds to be able to fund all of the applications. So one of the ways, you know, um, I know Jeff Vanderwild has talked about this several times and now, and we're moving towards this process is the conservation implementation strategy areas and really focused, focused or targeted conservation. So as you can see here, this is that is something that we've made a priority. Um, so basically, the way this tool works is producer, you know, comes in and requests our technical assistance. We take a look at you know, what their past performance is. Have they had a terminated contract in the past? Um, have we, have we, you know, have they been willing to set up a planning meeting with us? And those, those individuals are going to receive a high priority. 
And then we're gonna go on to actually score um, those high priority applications. And this score really doesn't mean anything as far as ranking or anything is concerned, but it's just a tool that each district conservationist and resource unit conservationist can use to really prioritize applications, you know? And they're, they're not necessarily gonna be a magic number because it's gonna be different from resource unit to resource unit and from county to county. But we're really helping prioritize, okay, we wanna look at those areas, those uh, planning areas that are within our targeted areas that we are, are gonna target funding towards. So that's our conservation implementation strategy areas. That's our regional conservation partnership program areas. And we have several of those throughout the state. And then we also want to take a look at those areas, those planning um, land units that are within you know, some of our impaired water body um, watersheds and close to those impaired water bodies. And so that was that was very important to the committee as well. And then we we enabled this tool to be um, you know, basically localized by allowing the county office or the resource unit to select those local resource concerns for each of those areas. So this tool will look different from county to county, like I said. Um, and then it also was important for the, it was a, a priority um, on a certain level for our committee to you know, really get in touch with some of these first time producers that, that maybe haven't had a conservation plan developed in the past. And then, you know, and then also the, one of the priorities was okay, are we are this producer willing to do management activities? So this producer has come in, they said they want a pipeline and tank, but are they also willing to implement prescribed grazing on, uh, on a system-based approach? And so that was something else that, that's been important and it's been um, it prioritized. And it's also prioritized in our program rankings and those types of things. And the last thing that we looked at is, you know, what portion of the operation is this, producer willing to uh, look at doing conservation activities on. And so we felt that it was important to prioritize that information as well and, and look at an overall picture of that producer's operation, not just you know land unit by land unit, but um, but the whole the whole operation. So um, you know that's something that we've put together. I, I think Jeff Vanderwilt is maybe going to jump in a little bit and discuss what he would like to see as far as um, resource concerns and prioritizing those also on a state level, so that we have that um, information going forward. Um, and with that, I'll let him jump in. I'll stop sharing here, and then um, we'll have a few minutes for questions. Well, thanks, Jess. Um, and just real quick, I just wanted to give you guys all a heads up that here in 2021, um, we're wanting to get our state resource concerns um, updated. So what, what should we be focused on for the next couple of years? Um, if you remember a couple of years ago, we, we did the same thing. We, we, we reached out to each of you on this uh, state tech committee here and asked you and your, you know, your organizations what are your priority resource concerns for South Dakota? What should we be focusing on? And we use those resource concerns in a couple of ways. Um, you know, one is with our programs. Um, and two, I, I see a use or a need for them potentially coming um, with us helping determine which conservation implement, implementation strategy projects uh, we would like to fund as well. So I'm giving you guys just a heads up. Uh, that we're going to try to send you some stuff uh, and start putting some pieces into motion so that we can start collecting that data this year, uh, either by the next state tech or the one after it, uh, this, the summer one. Uh, we'll want to try to get that feedback and, and get those in place before our calendar or our fiscal year 22, 2022 begins. So that is our plans. I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that this is gonna be coming so that it doesn't catch you off guard if we send you some information saying, hey, you know, we're gonna to try to start collecting uh, resource concern information so that we can prioritize that for South Dakota for 2022. So just a brief heads up and I'll turn it back to Jess and go from there. All right, are there any questions? OK, 
Okay, if not, I'll turn it back to Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff and Jess. Appreciate it. I, you know, I just would summarize and close by telling you this. Um, we as an agency are all about customer service, serving our customers the best we can. Um, and we're always going to be encouraging producers to come in and request conservation plans. It's really the best first step in making good uh, resource decisions out in the landscape. And then we can take it from there to help find the resources from many different sources to help them implement those conservation plans. Our goal will always be, of course, to write a conservation plan for everyone who needs one. But we, but we all have to realize that there's at a certain point in time, there's going to be more planning requests than we can meet. So this is just about prioritizing those, and then we can continue to move on, and hopefully we can, you know, at a time get to all of the planning requests and get everybody headed. Uh, further down their conservation journey. So thank you so much for that. Next on the agenda is the conservation implementation strategy. Jeff Vanderwilt's going to visit with you about that. And I just want to say that uh, this is a topic that we have talked with you about for numerous years. We kicked it off in 2019, and this year will be our first year of having dollars actually implemented out through a targeted approach. We're really excited about this. I think this has so much potential for us all in South Dakota to really uh, get conservation on the landscape, but also do it in a way that provides some real measurable benefits. And so I'm so proud of Jeff and his leadership on this and what our uh, partners across the state, including our local staff have done. Jeff, share that good news and talk about what we're gonna do in 2020, 2021, excuse me. Yeah, no problem. So I'll start off by talking about 2020, actually. Um, we, and I think you guys have all been made aware, we funded 16 projects in 2020. Uh, the annual request or the annual funding that's going to go to those projects here in 2020 is, is just uh, right around the $3 million mark. Now, these are multi-year projects, so that's just year one for all 16. Uh, obviously, next year, they'll have an additional allocation, but uh, we are, I was hoping we'd have it done. We're not quite there. We're so very close to having the website um, up and running that would actually show you on a map where the different projects are and uh, give you a little update about each one of those projects. We're, I mean, we're very close. In fact, I would have said it would have been ready, but we found just a couple of hiccups that we're trying to figure out and get fixed. Um, so it's very close to being on the streets. And I, I really, I really think before Christmas for sure it'll be it'll be there if you guys go look for it. Um, so that's kind of where we're at, and that'll give you the update or the information on all uh, 16 of those projects that you guys can go look and see what those look like. Um, so hopefully, you know, they'll have some success this year. We've had some news releases go out. Some batching periods have come and gone for some of those projects. They're working on the planning now, and um, as soon as our ranking software is up and running, we'll we'll start ranking some of those applications for those projects and actually get some of those dollars obligated here before too long, hopefully. So that's kind of where we're at with 2020. Now, of course, we got to look to the future. And so we're uh, just released last week uh, the sign up or the announcement for CIS projects for 2021. And I'm sharing my screen. This is the new um fact sheet that we put together and that is on our website and then we also have a new uh implementation strategy or the the template that you need to use to submit that project proposal to myself or jennifer words one of the things that we changed and we kind of forewarned everybody that this was going to happen and uh, i do believe we're able to make this happen this year is that it will now include all three of our um, major programs here at NRCS. And so those three are the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the Conservation Stewardship Program, and the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. If you remember last year, we left CSP out as we didn't feel like we were able to incorporate it at that time. Uh, and I think things have changed or we feel more comfortable now about including CSP into this uh, offering for CIS. So that does a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, probably it increases the amount of funding that's available for CIS. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to use some of our 
uh, CSP Classic funds uh, towards these projects. Secondly, I think it's another opportunity for these projects to find ways to implement conservation to get to that final outcome that that how you know how we're going to move that conservation needle with these projects. Now you have all three tools essentially at your disposal to 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 you know work towards that that outcome that you are that you're shooting for that you're measuring. And again, you know, the biggest thing about CIS is is really about that outcome. You know, having having the ability to say at the end of the three or five year project that hey, this is what we accomplished, and let's all get together and celebrate the fact that we were able to address this resource concern as a group, right? Uh, as a team, we kind of came together, we focused in on on treating this resource concern in this particular area, and here's what we're able to accomplish. The one thing that I've been telling people that I kind of noticed about our 2020 sign up was there seemed to be a lot of concern about, you know, documenting that outcome and maybe even a little bit of apprehension about, boy, I don't even know if I'm really going to be able to show much of an outcome. We're dealing with mother nature. These things take time to change, to, to heal. And I think all of us realize that. And I think if we can get over the fact that we're looking to make this big grandiose um, outcome happen and just realize that it's the little things, it's the, it's the small changes that will eventually lead to big changes and realize if we can make these small changes in a focused area with, with a concentrated effort, uh, after, after several CIS projects, I think we'll see that big grandiose change that a lot of people kind of kind of think we need to accomplish. So I want you to think small. I don't think you need to think about big grandiose outcomes. Think small outcomes. Think about making that change, moving that needle just that little bit, and let's put some projects together and, and make some great things happen on the landscape. Uh, myself and Jennifer Wirtz are always willing to sit down and talk with you guys about um, CIS project ideas. If you're thinking about including easements and CSP, we, you can definitely talk to Joyce and Brandon as well. All four of us are more than willing to discuss the ins and outs of the programs and ways that we can make those programs fit into your project ideas. And I think if we just sit down and talk some things out, you guys will realize that there's a lot more potential out there uh, than you think as far as finding these projects and making those outcomes happen. So. The due date is April 15th, 2021. Uh, you know, if, if you guys are procrastinators with your taxes, I'm just gonna tell you, get these done first, then worry about your taxes. But April 15th is that date. So, you know, try to get those accomplished, work with us. We, we kind of give it this long period of time so that there is an opportunity for us to have discussions that need to happen uh, so that you can make sure you can get those proposals together. There are no match requirements, uh, but if you have a, a, a willing partner or if you have some funds that you wanna bring to the table as well, uh, we're always welcome that opportunity to match our funds with your funds to make something happen as well. And let's see, other than that, I think it's just that April 15th is the big date to get those proposals in. We will make our selections then in May. And then funding will actually come after the first of the fiscal year. So October, November-ish timeline, uh, if our budgets come through uh, and we have our funds in hand, then we can, we'll, we essentially turn those funds over to you in a way uh, of, of helping us put the plans together, helping us make those funding selections at that time. So if you get one funded, don't just think that you got it funded and you get to walk away. Uh, we're going to be kind of in constant contact with you, working on the outreach, working on the planning, and then obviously making those funding selections to make sure that we get those contracts in place that will help you get to your outcomes for your projects. I don't know if I've said the word outcomes enough yet. I can't stress it enough, to be honest with you. That's what this is about. We really want to be able to show some outcomes. We've been doing a lot of good work for a lot of years. And I think the one thing we've lacked all those years is being able to actually show some outcomes. And with CIS, that is our goal, is to be able to show people, here's what we've accomplished, here's how we've moved that needle. So overall, that's our goal with, with CIS. So 
Any questions about CIS and, and the April 15th date and how this all works from anybody? These documents are on our website. If you go to South Dakota NRCS and search around in there for CIS, you'll you'll find the documents in there, the vision statement uh, and the temp or the, the vision fact sheet and this template document are both in there and soon, very soon will be the, uh, the interactive map that will show you all the existing projects and give you some details about what those existing projects are. Jeff. Yes, ma'am. This is Colette Kessler, and I just wanted to mention to everyone that if if um, Jeff Vanderwilt or Jennifer Wirtz's phone is busy or whatever, um, that please know that there's uh, NRCS employees all across the state that can help you with brainstorming for ideas. And uh, of course, I'm available too for helping um, move through the template process for ideas and, and figuring how things might work. And then um, later on, you'll hear from Blaine Brackey, who's got um, to mention their uh, resource concerns project. So thanks. Great job, Jeff. Are there any questions at all? All right, this is a great opportunity for South Dakota and all of you out there as our partners. So we're looking excited about what will come forward in 2021 related to the conservation implementation strategy. Uh, next on the agenda, Jeff and his team, or uh, he may lead a lot of it, but we're going to talk about some of the things that happened with our programs from 2020, kind of wrap up some things, but even focus a little bit more on the direction that we're going in 2021 and seeking some you on several of those things. So, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you for our program update. You bet. And since I'm on here, I'll tell you what, I'll talk about RCPP quick. And then I will uh, turn it over to, to the rest of my staff to, to cover their individual programs. So just a real quick update on RCPP. Uh, that's the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Uh, at, today I can let you know the, the batching date or the um, proposal due date was November 30th. Uh, we had five South Dakota partners submit applications for this round of RCPP. There was $360 million available nationally, and I believe they've got $850 million worth of requests. So obviously, you know, way more uh, project proposals than there is funding, uh, which is pretty typical. Uh, the good thing is, you know, all of our critical conservation areas and uh, just about all the states uh, had proposals uh, submitted that would uh, somehow include them. So we were, South Dakota, I should say, was part of a couple of multi-state project proposals, and then we've got a couple of just in-state project proposals in those five. Uh, they're gonna go through a review process uh, between now and I'll say probably about the middle of January. And then uh, that review process will be given, or those results will be given to the chief, for the chief to make some funding decisions, uh, probably in February would be my guess. So. Uh, we kind of got to sit tight here for a little bit, wait for the process to work out, and then see where we end up with um, as far as any new projects go for 2021. Uh, we did get some new projects here in 2020. The um, the uh, east east or excuse me, the Mini High High Conservation District uh, has a big Sioux water quality project that got funded. Uh, the uh, Belfouche River Watershed Partnership also got one funded for 2020, so we'll have two new projects there. Uh, the Lewis and Clark project through the James River Water Development District got extended. They did a renewal opportunity, and so we're looking forward to working with them as well. Uh, we did have a new uh, AFA. Uh, those are called alternative funding arrangements. So RCPP has kind of been broken out into almost three options or opportunities, the renewals, the regular um, project proposals, and then they have these alternative funding arrangements. And we actually had two of those get funded that will affect South Dakota. Now one is with Ducks Unlimited, where Ducks Unlimited is the lead partner and South Dakota is the lead state. And then we're also gonna be involved in one with Audubon 
which covers North Dakota and South Dakota, and North Dakota is the lead state on that. So it's kind of exciting times. Um, RCPP came about in the 2014 Farm Bill, and we had a total of five projects get funded uh, across that entire Farm Bill. Now in one year, we've had five projects get funded. So RCPP is really starting to grow here in South Dakota. And I can't stress enough, uh, for those of you that are thinking RCPP and thinking CIS and going, which one should I do? Which one's better, blah, blah, blah. I would tell you that they're a perfect match for each other and they're a perfect opportunity to, to take, one, take one proposal if it doesn't get funded in RCPP, it'll roll fairly easily over into CIS and vice versa. So essentially what we've created now is a couple of opportunities for you guys to put project proposals together and find ways to get them funded. So I'm really excited about that opportunity. I think RCPP is a great way to bring additional funds to our state. You heard Jessica say earlier, and, and you'll hear my staff tell you here in a little bit too, you know, some of our, our our program funding, specific program funding is going down and RCPP is a great way to kind of offset that decrease in some of those programs. We can take those targeted funds, bring them to South Dakota and make something great happen that way as well. Again, RCPP is about uh, targeted outcomes and moving that conservation needle. So there's a lot of similarities between it and CIS. So, that's kind of where we sit with RCPP real quick, and I'll just ask if anybody's got any questions um, about any of the projects. I'll try to answer those, or if anybody's got questions about the proposal process as well, we can go over that too if anybody's got questions. All right, now I'm going to stop talking, and I will turn it over to Jen Wirtz. Uh, I believe Jen is on, and she can talk about uh, our eQuip program for 2020 and 2021. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't know if you need me to bring up my handout, but it is the next handout after the CIS uh, information that Jeff just covered. And I'm just going to touch on a few things for fiscal year 21 EQIP. Um, last tech committee meeting, we went through how we wrapped up the uh, fiscal year 2020 with all of the fund pools and assessments that were funded. Um, this year, we're looking at just over $13.8 million for our GEQIP general funds, $500,000 in, in honeybee funds, um, $325,000 for the National Water Quality Initiative. Uh, that, again, is going to be in the Fire Seal Creek area and then 400,000 for our sage grouse initiative. And like Jeff already pointed out, the, the 16 conservation implementation strategies um, will have their first year of funding in fiscal year 2020. Uh, and that is approximately $3 million that we're going to put towards those projects uh, out of our general equip al allocation. And then just kind of an initial timeline, uh, we had, you know, December 11th is our batching date here that next week, Friday already. Uh, we'll look at having that, some of the initial eligibility determinations done in January, end of January. And for anybody that's working with or is applying for EQIP, that includes filing AGI with uh, FSA and also, you know, making sure all of your your farm records are up to date, compliance with wetland and highly erodible lands. Um, our tentative time for ranking is in, in mid-March with pre-approvals happening that following week. And hopefully we have a wrap up of obligations by the end of April. Uh, that, is, that is our goal for this year. Again, we, we're always subject to change as things go through. So is there any other questions with EQIP this morning? Okay, that's pretty much all I had, Jeff, unless you wanted to touch on anything else I missed. Oh, that works for me. All right, I'll turn it over to Joyce Trevithick to discuss CSP then. 
Good morning. It looks like you must have that up, Jeff, for the CSP report on the agenda. Yep, sure and do. If each of you are following along, it's on page 13 of the agenda items, agenda for handouts. So just run through the quick report on those for CSP 2021 renewals, which the application sign up deadline was batching date was in October. We received 693 total applications. The initial allocation was 7.8 million, so it's not going to go real far, but um, our initial ranking date was tomorrow. We'll see how many we get ranked by then with all the issues that come up with our tools. And the obligation deadline on the 2021-1 renewals is February 26th. Um, so we're working slowly, working through those, and. Hopefully next week we'll know what we have for pre-approvals on, on those. This is your initial allocations of that 7.8 million. Of course, 10% goes to the beginning farmer and 10% to socially disadvantaged. And then each of the resource units had a percentage based on what was received in last, in 2020 renewals. So we'll move on to GSI, GCI, I mean, CSP GCI. Um, again, October 16th was the ranking batching deadline for that one. The state did receive $338,000 on that and 61 applications. And that application deadline is December 31st. Seeing as how the state hasn't received funding for that yet, though, the allocation has not got through with issues with programs at the national level. We'll see how that moves forward. But anyway, um, we're Moving forward slowly on that one too. So then the preliminary data data on tw CSP 2021-1 classics. We don't have a lot of information yet, but we do have our initial allocation. That's $7.85 million. And that initial application deadline is March 26th. The one thing they did do different on the classic is they separated out the organic and the transitioning organic. And that will be a separate allocation, so that's not coming out of this initial allocation. And then there's also a 2022 renewal application deadline of March 26. So that's the information we have on CSP. And if anybody has questions, feel free to ask them. Just one thing I'll this is Jeff. One thing I'll touch on is. The GCI, that 338,000, um, if additional funds are needed to fund those 61 applications, we'll get those additional funds as necessary to fund those. Uh, GCI is kind of an automatic funding kind of a situation. So although it is usually pretty small acreages um, and it's $18 an acre, so those are not very expensive contracts either. So we'll see how far that goes, but uh, if we don't have enough funding, they will make up that funding to make sure that those get funded. So um, the other thing I'll mention is last year for our for classic, you know, we received $10 million. That was kind of the cap they had put on it last year. And you can see they lowered it this year to that 7.85 million. I, there's about 14 states in the nation that were all capped at that, that amount. Um, as they try to spread this program out more nationwide, uh, you know, that's where this cap kind of has come from. So there will be an opportunity for us, I am sure, uh, to increase that. Just like last year, we started out at 10 million. We were able to increase that by a couple of million. Uh, hopefully we can uh, be able to do that same thing this year as CSP continues to be a very popular program in South Dakota. So we'll continue to do our best to try to bring additional funds that other states are not able to use uh, here into South Dakota as well for, for CSPs. And the same would hold true hold true for EQIP and easements that Brandon will talk about here in a minute. We, we're almost always oversubscribed and almost always able to bring some additional funds into the state uh, where other states were unable to use those funds. So, Any questions on CSP? Jeff, no question, but just one comment. I want to just kind of build on what uh, Jessica talked about earlier and you talked about and Joyce talked about, but emphasize a little bit a different way. 
you you heard folks that CSP was an extremely popular program in South Dakota. You know, at one time we led the country in the number of acres that we had enrolled in the program. Because of this work that's going on nationally to have this be a very national program, there's folks that are making statements kind of like this to me, like, well, CSP is going away. And that's be, they're getting that impression because they're seeing fewer dollars come to South Dakota. I just want to emphasize to you that the conservation stewardship program is not going away. Um, it is just the, the only thing that South Dakota, we had been able to obtain a much greater share of that program nationally in our state than really was what we should have had. You know, and now you might all disagree. I, I was very glad that we could bring those dollars to South Dakota, but we just had a very large share of that program. So the key of it is now it's just kind of trying to be distributed across the country to make it truly have an impact nationally. And we're feeling a little bit of that pinch. But I want you to know it's not because conservation stewardship's going away. It's only that way because we're just trying to really ensure as an agency that it has value, adds value across the entire country. So we're going to continue to use it here well. We'll be ready to pick up any uh, additional dollars we can in South Dakota. And I'm sure, uh, and I'm sure it's going to get used more and more. But I think Jeff hit a key on the head earlier when he talked about RCPP. That would be another exceptional way to bring some additional resource um, conservation stewardship dollars to our state by trying to target them to accomplish set goals. So keep that in mind. Thanks, Jeff. I'll let you have her back. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next, I'll have Brandon uh, start talking about our easement program here in South Dakota, and I'll, I'll get this uh, rotated so everybody can see it. So Brandon, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Can you hear me all right? Sure can. All right, thank you. Uh, so the first topic I'd like to uh, talk about uh, today here is our proposed easement compensation rates for WRE uh, for fiscal year 2021. Uh, this year, what we're uh, requesting uh, via our processes is to do an extension to our fiscal year 20 compensation rates. Um, this process requires our contractor to analyze sales data across our market area, which is the majority of it is eastern part of South Dakota and a few counties just to the west of the Missouri River. Uh, what they need to look at is sales data to ensure that we did not have a change in valuation um, plus or minus 10% over the previous year. Um, so they were able to look at about 400 sales um, later on here this fall. Um, we expected there to be a decrease in the sales, um, and that is what their results showed. However, it was a pretty small decrease, and it did not go over the 10%. Uh, so due to that, what we're proposing uh, to our headquarters team is to uh, review our data and approve us to proceed in fiscal year 2021 with our rates from last year. Um, Similar to other years, we do have a few counties um, where no sales data was available for review. Um, so those counties, we would still be required to use an appraisal if we would have an offer in that area. Uh, so I guess what I would be asking of anyone on this call that um, in the handouts that Kathy provided us, um, there is this spreadsheet along with another uh, map that lists the sales data that we're proposing for this year. Um, if you have any questions or comments on those proposed rates, I would ask that you provide them to me and uh, Kathy by December 11th. Um, gives us a little time to communicate with you guys before we submit, submit our final packet to headquarters on these rates. Uh, before I move on from the rates, I guess open up to any questions specifically on this topic. All right, here now I'm just gonna touch a little bit on fiscal year 21. Um, currently at this time, we have not announced um, an application period for our WRE or ALE. Uh, we are awaiting some further guidance 
um, from national headquarters. I'm really hoping that I hear something in the next few weeks so we can get this out um, before the holidays. But uh, with everything that's going on, who knows when it'll be. But uh, like similar years, as soon as uh, we have that announcement, we'll get that out um, in publications. But um, like they mentioned, all the other programs, we did see a decrease in what we got for funds. We received about $3.6 million for the acquisition. Uh, so that will be straight up used for the purchasing of new easements. Uh, we did receive a new allocation this year, um, which we received about $1. million in stewardship funds, which we are pretty excited about. Uh, what these funds are going to be used for is for uh, maintenance uh, management and monitoring practice on our existing easements. Um, We've been doing this in South Dakota probably actually for about, I'd say three or four years, somewhere around there. But, uh, you know, we know there's a huge benefit uh, to these easements and we can't just acquire them and, and let them go. So we need to keep up on our activities. So with that $1.1 million, we're hoping we can go in on quite a few properties and do some further conservation practices. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we've been hearing a, a lot from our landowners uh, that are interested in participating in those activities. So um, again, really excited about that and looking forward to seeing what that brings in future years as well. Uh, the last topic that I do have for you guys today is our EWP floodplain easements. Uh, we currently are just wrapping up the process with uh, that application period. Um, it, it goes a little bit different than some of our easement programs, but we did receive about 33 applications for just over $16 million. Um, we will be reviewing all those packets um, and then we submit them to headquarters here in the next few weeks. And after they complete their process, they come back to the states and let us know how many we'll be able to fund. So uh, we're hopeful that we can get a, a high amount there too, but we know there's other states that are working through that process as well there. So. That is what I have for you folks today on the easement program, and I guess I'd open up for any questions for anyone that has any. Thanks so much, Brandon. Appreciate all your work on that and the whole program's team. Jeff, do you have any closing comments at all that you would like to add to wrap up the program section before we move to the emergency water program? Yeah, the only thing I would say, folks, is, you know, again, I want to emphasize the fact that I think we're seeing a little bit of a change in how funding is going to come to South Dakota. And, um, I, you know, I, I guess I just make a little bit of a plea for, for your assistance to to help us with project proposals for RCPP and CIS uh, to, to bring some of these extra funds that we're, we might be able to bring into South Dakota through those through those efforts. So if you guys have any questions or concerns on some of that stuff, you know, just let me know and I'm happy to happy to visit with you about that. But I just I see a lot of opportunities where we could we could do something to bring some additional dollars and would just love to work with some folks to do that. So with that, Jeff, that's my update. All right, thank you, sir. Next, we're going to move to the emergency watershed program. It's another effort that's been underway this year. We're doing some good to help some communities out there. And Jay Cobb, our state conservation uh, engineer, is going to just share a little update on those. You've heard about those before. We just want to keep this uh, kind of on your radar in case we have some issues that will arise in South Dakota in the future where you could use this kind of help. So, Jay, I'll turn it to you. Sir. All right, am I coming through? There are. All right. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everybody. I'm just going to do this pretty quickly. Just take a few minutes to give you an update on our EWP activities on the recovery side of things. Uh, we currently have five EWP projects that are ongoing in the state, and they include the repair of the Murdo Dam Auxiliary Spillway, repair of the Belvedere Dam Auxiliary Spillway, and repair of Bruley 26 Watershed Dam Auxiliary Spillway. You can tell we had an issue with auxiliary spillways. And then also debris removal from Oak Creek and Whitehorse Creeks in Todd County. And then the last project was repair uh, erosion on the backside of an ag waste holding pond along the Little White River in Bennett County. And all these uh, 
projects are in various stages of construction right now, with the exception of the Bennett County project, which they recently uh, completed. So it's hoped, I mean, a lot of these projects are getting started late uh, this year. And, you know, I'm hoping that we can get some of them completed before we freeze up this winter. Um, but my guess is that we're going to need to extend some of these agreements into the spring in order to complete construction. And they total about, I don't know, half million dollars in construction funds. We're somewhere in that ballpark for all these projects together. And that's kind of the update. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jay. I just would uh, remind people that as well with uh, the emergency watershed program that we used it effectively to help our state partners a year or two ago in Custer State Park after the fire. Uh, we used the emergency watershed program there to help uh, be ready for some additional runoff that can always occur after a fire. And so it's just another example. It's a diverse program that really helps us work with partners. And the last thing I want to do is just give a real shout out to the Conservation District and the South Dakota Association of Conservation Districts for their work on EWP. In most of the cases, they're local sponsors. They're kind of like leading these efforts. They're working with people locally to make this happen. So a real shout out to Conservation Districts, what they're doing to kind of help this these dollars get on the landscape, kind of make us be more resilient going forward. So way to go, folks. Next, we talked earlier about uh, the fact that the Conservation Reserve Program um, was very busy in 2020, and Owen's going to come on and join us. Don may as well to speak a little bit about the Conservation Reserve Program, maybe tie up some of the uh, put a bow on 2020, Owen, and maybe talk a little bit about 2021. So I'll turn it to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's staying safe out there. If you're like me, this telework's getting old, but uh, still, still hear me. It's saying I have bad work quality. You are a little choppy, Owen, but uh, you're coming through, but um, do right. the best you can. Well, you might, might have to go without camera. I can do that. I have a face for radio. Uh, wanted to just touch on a few things, I guess. Uh, the main reason for today's call was to button up uh, a review of our conservation priority that is used for Elves Bill for the next general signup, general CRP. Uh, that announcement for that general CRP signup was on November 13th, and the date general sign up are January 4th through 12th. Uh, following that, we'll be doing a grassland sign up March 15th through April 23rd. These dates may uh, sound familiar and reason being that with the 2018 Farm Bill, we have reoccurring anniversaries now of this particular sign ups. So we're getting more to under be able to for when they, both agencies, both NRCS and FSA, then are also going to be able to prioritize their workload, um, know what's coming. I guess so. Surprises on when the signups are, and look for some great successes with that. Uh, what I want to review briefly is on the handout towards the bottom, there were a couple maps and then a memo that was submitted on behalf of the CRP subcommittee through the state. What we were tasked with or what why we had to make some revisions to the existing CPA zone is we had too many acres of cropland um, within that and um, so, so we had to pare that down 
by some acres to meet the 25% cropland factor within that CPA. So what the subcommittee ended up doing is we removed one huck zone uh, down in the southern part of Tripp County. Uh, there's been, statistically, there's been minimal activity in general CRP in that particular area. And the cropland removed then to meet that 20% factor. Deadline was the 27th of November. We had to have that review completed. Uh, of the state today, other than just to review and finalize that process. So, so I guess with that, are there any questions or concerns on that particular piece? And then I'll review some statistics from last year. Okay, so as Jeff said, we had some uh, a big lift from last year, some great interest in the CRP program. Uh, if I go, I can share this as well. Maybe. Oh. Computer illiterate today, so I'm just going to review the statistics. But so under the general CRP sign up that we conducted last year, at the end of that sign up and what went to contract, we had 963 offers that made it to contract for a total of 53,160. We had a regular continuous sign up. Uh, where we enrolled 1,984 contracts, a total of 35,823 acres. We had the FWP component of the regular continuous sign up, and that consisted of 150 contracts, I'm sorry, 439 contracts for a total of 12,891 acres. Uh, we had a re-enrollment opportunity under the current crop agreement with the state of South Dakota. We had 150 of those that were enrolled, re-enrolled for a total of 15,384 acres. And then probably the, the biggest swing we had was with the CRP grasslands, the working land CRP program. We had 1,057 contracts for a total of 338,341 acres. We had some minimal activity in the program. Uh, to date, we've got 17 of 339. There is one additional batch that we did realize in uh, December here will still be counted towards that total. So if we um, add up all of those numbers, we had 4,610 total offers that went to contract for a total of 455,952 acres, which statewide then, if we include those into what's already been enrolled with previous signups, we're at roughly 1,389,000 acres in the state of South Dakota. So we've got some, some plans, conservation on the landscape, and uh, did some great things. I uh, got to give kudos, shout outs to both NRCS and Pheasants Forever. Uh, we held weekly meetings, basically the last two to three months of the fiscal year to be sure that we had a had our pulse on where that workload was at, uh, what needed to get done yet, so that we could meet the lines that were in front of us and, and get these contracts. So I guess with that, I would uh, make one last comment. Uh, we did most recently update our who was just realized with a CRP notice that was issued early this week. And they're on the USDA uh, website. There is a 
report that's available that highlights what the average soil rental rate is for each county uh, within the state. But the quick and dirty on that is we, we've adopted position to the 2021 soil rental rates, which is based off the prior year's NAS Statistical Service uh, dry land catchment rate. Uh, so we did see some increases in some counties. We did see some decreases in some counties. Uh, pretty reflective of what the, the rents are within each county. And those are effective. Those are effective December 1 for any future signups. And again, I did highlight those dates of the general CRP signup, the grassland signup, and a reminder that we continuous sign up is ongoing. So a participant could come in today and make offer on sign up 55 under the continuous sign up. So that's where I'm at, Jeff. Um, hopefully everything came through all right. I, I kept getting that message. So hopefully it wasn't too painful to listen to. Thank you. Oh, and it was okay. There were just a few times you broke up a little bit, but I think mostly the gist of your message got out to everyone and really appreciate that report. So are there any questions for Owen before we move on? Owen, thanks for the partnership on CRP and so many other fronts. So appreciate that. Topic number nine is the South Dakota Wetland and HEL Compliance Update. And Deke Hobbick, our Assistant State Conservation Compliance, will provide that. So Deke, I'll please. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Hello, everyone. I hope everybody's doing good today. I am. Struggling getting my thing to come out in here. I'll let you know when I see it, Deke. I'm not yet. <laughs> yeah, I should be seeing it. I'm sharing and it's not working for me. Well, let's try this. All right, I'm going to need a moment here, Jeff. It's saying I don't have access to my own files. Well, Deke, what I'll do is we'll just move on to a few other agenda items that we've got. That'll be fine. You get your files figured out and we'll come back to you in just a second. OK. All right. Hold on a second here. Maybe ah, I, there I think go. you've you've got them now, sir. All right. Sorry about that. I obviously and showing myself I'm not as smart as I thought it was. Anyway, here's our wetland workload. Um, came off last year, it was a fairly busy year. We did about 1600 determinations. That's up maybe just a little bit. We kind of average around 1400. But the data you see here is gonna be from October 1st, 2020, starting the new fiscal year. Um, we have on our 569s, basically nine in progress, one completed and four received. 
keep in mind that you know a lot of these numbers are carry there's some carryover from the previous year so they don't always seem to match up sometimes in some people's eyes um, we got 252 uh, wetland delineations in progress and we have completed 183 so far since october 1 and then we've received another 164 so everything's coming in about as normal i would expect this year we'll probably do everywhere from 1500 to 1600 determinations is my guess um, the age of the workload is uh it's good i mean the majority of them are you know a good chunk of them are less than 30 days but for the most part everything is largely three months or less um, some of the outliers you see on the six months and five months a lot of times do it or deal with working with participants that you know what works for them you know some people want us out there at certain times or people are busy so it all depends and crops are out and freeze up if they want us on site to do some work uh, one thing that i did decide to add in here um, was just the appeals just so we can kind of see kind of where you know like 2017 you know, we did about 1900 determinations and we had about 63 of those appealed um, so our appeal percentage was a little higher you know compared to nine and ten years ago this is significantly lower uh, as you can see then it trends down 2018 to 165 2019 153 and 2020 um, to 1.65 so you know we still get a get appeals and rightfully so i mean many of the appeals that we get you know producers do have information that we're not privy to so it usually works out you know pretty good to get that info from them um you know other than that it's just a general understanding of one wetlands but also you know the the way that the usda delineates wetlands you know our process and procedure you know a lot of producers just want to try to understand that better and it it can be difficult to grasp sometimes um, that is all i had on you know the wetland compliance front there so very good deke did you want to share any information on highly erodible land compliance or save that for another time well i can sure do it i don't have any numbers for you i know we're sitting at about 65 um 1026 is that we have to complete highly erodible determinations on um for the most part you know we had a i wouldn't say a huge backlog but we get a good number of those every year depending on you know how operations change and my team recently took that over in the past year and we're able to zero that down and now we're climbing back up and we just kind of manage that workload as it comes in as best we can. Very good. Thank you so much. Appreciate the work of you and your team and what you do in wetland and HEL compliance. So thanks much. Any questions for Deke at all? All right, we've got just a few other things that have that people want to address under the other category. So I'm going to be making another call out if there's any additional items. In but first of all, let's handle I mentioned a salinity web meeting that's coming up. And I know that we were uh, hoping to have some uh, some partners join us and Colette, I'm going to let you take it away. I haven't seen some of those partners on the list, but uh, maybe was Jim Risto going to address that? There you go. Yes, this is Jim. Can you hear me? Sure can, Jim. Take it. All right. Just wanted to uh, put this on the calendar for folks. Um, in cooperation with Agtegra, we're just going to have a discussion about salinity. What are the causes? Um, what can be done about it? Uh, what are the economics and then and then what sort of programs are there in support so i invite everyone to join or spread this within your uh social media and we're hoping for a good turnout this will be recorded but the target is farmers we're trying to get this to farmers so uh the the link to the meeting and there is it's happening on uh, next wednesday on on the 9th at 10 a.m 
And the link is the SDSU Zoom site. So you can probably find that from, if nowhere else, the SDSU Extension website under their events tab. Thank you. Jim, thanks for sharing that opportunity. Uh, next, let's go to Blaine Brackey to share a little bit. Blaine works with the South Dakota Association of Conservation District. About a survey, but also visit a little bit about um, kind of their locally led efforts. So, Blaine, to you, sir. Hey, Jeff, thanks. Um, yeah, I work with uh, conservation districts, um, Angela Ehlers, and then, of course, NRCS on a CCG. Uh, that we call locally led. Um, I guess I just want to touch base quick on a survey that we're hopefully going to get out here in the next um, couple weeks. Um, and we'll use this survey again in kind of, I don't know, two or three years to um, kind of reassess where we're at. But for the most part, that survey is going to be sent to conservation districts employees and board members um, through online and email so if there's any um, district employees or board members on um, this call be on the lookout for that um, but and what we're going to look at there is just kind of the overall experience levels with you know grant opportunities and funding opportunities communication um, conservation planning and then kind of any training that might be necessary to help with as was spoken earlier about CIS um, and then kind of that targeted conservation um, goal that we're looking for here so we're we're hoping to kind of get a temperature check on kind of where everybody's at right now and especially when the wheels really start moving here over the next year or two um, ways that we can help kind of increase that participation and that knowledge base of our conservation districts and then those boards. Um, and I guess just to, to tee off what, what kind of everybody was talking about earlier with the CIS, um, those of you on the, on the call to reach out to your local supervisors or your conservation district to connect with them, um, kind of about that resource concern prioritization. Um, that's been one of the focuses of our project is um, through surveys and and online um, seems like we have quite a few different tools that we've that we've shot out to conservation districts to try to um, start this process of that resource concern prioritization at the at the local level um, so kind of by each conservation district to help um, I guess lead the charge there as we move into more CIS and targeted um, acts of conservation. Um, so yeah, I just had, a, I guess, a quick note, be on the lookout for any of those surveys and um, connect with your local supervisors and get those resource concerns um, to them. But I guess that's all I have, Jeff, if you have any other questions for me. Very good. Are there any other questions for Blaine at all? Thank you, sir. Appreciate the work you do. Thank you. Two other quick topics that we've talked about in the past that I'll just bring up. Um, our conservation collaboration grant program that many of you have worked with us on. We're going to get that announcement out again, hopefully before the end of this calendar year. Uh, hopefully we can leave that open for anywhere from six weeks to two months so that you can put together uh, uh, applications. Another great way for us to work with you all as partners and uh, just encourage you to start thinking about that now visit with nrcs folks that you know that would be a part of that effort um, if you'd like to remember that program is part of our uh, really using our technical assistance dollars which means it's really about boots on the ground and so it could be a lot of what we've heard today is about financial assistance to help get practices on the landscape but the boots on the ground could actually help make that work so don't be afraid to ask us about that and encourage that. Another effort we'll get out soon will be our conservation innovation grants. Even the past I allocated about $150,000 of our equip money for that and have solicited and received applications. We had a couple last year that we funded and we'll continue to do that in 2021. So we'll 
With that, I just want to ask if there's any other agenda items that any of you all would like to bring to the floor for this state technical committee. Well, hearing none, then my final announcement will be is um, after eight and a half years um, and probably based on my calculations, about 34 state technical committee meetings that I've had the opportunity to serve with you. I will be stepping down as state conservationist, retiring um, from this position. It has been great. It's been amazing to work with all of you. Um, I remember so many different state technical committees and the work that we've done as partners across our state. I really um, will have fond memories of these efforts and how we've worked together on that. So thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you at future state technical committee meetings, but I'm gonna be not be standing in the front of the room, uh, maybe sitting in the back of the room, but listening in to see all the work that you continue to do in conservation across our amazing state. So thank you so much for joining. At one time today, I seen that we had six nine people that had joined our state technical committee meeting. That's a great turnout. Um, I still too, um, maybe based on my age, really look forward to seeing you more in person and being able to shake hands. But unfortunately, that's just not, a, uh, you know, something that we can do today. But thank you again. Reach out to us if we have any, if you have any questions uh, regarding any of our programs and the efforts that we do in conservation. Uh, across our state, but we do it all in a partnership with you. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Be safe out there and uh, wishing you all a great holiday season here toward the end of this calendar year of 2020. Thank you all. Have a great day.